Jason Trier just tweeted out like 10 minutes ago, Activision Blizzard CEO, Bobby Kotick stepping down after nearly 33 years writes a letter to his staff. Extraordinary people. Over the years, my passion for video games has often been attributed to Pitfall, River Raid, and Kaboom. Lots of explanation points in those early days. All this stuff, you know, he's, I'm not that interested. <laughs> I'm gonna be honest. Um, yeah, we are now a part of the world's most admired company that is in an accident. Phil Spencer has appreciated the magic of ABK for decades. When he approached Brian and me two years ago and proposed acquiring the company, it was immediately obvious that the combination of our businesses would enable us to continue to lead as the list of capable, uh, well-resourced com competitor competitors grows. I can't read. Phil shares our values. That, I mean, that's concerning <laughs> for, for Bobby. I mean, I hope he doesn't share your values, I'll be honest. <laughs> I think we should all hope he doesn't. Uh, but... Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a typical CEO departure, like pat myself on the back kind of post. The thing with Bobby Kotick is that there's there's two sides of it, which I think like people outside the gaming industry that are not privy to a lot of the nitty gritty details of all this, they might not be aware of. Like Bobby Kotick, on the one hand, yeah, he's a very capable CEO. He grew Activision from what was 32 years ago, a very somewhat small company that was not as as massive it was not you know a multi-billion dollar 70 billion dollar company and over decades has built it into an absolute behemoth that then sold to microsoft for like 70 billion dollars right so he's a very capable ceo on the other hand he's a toxic piece of crap <laughs> and he has uh like very carefully seemingly over years and years and years sort of preserved a company culture that harbors toxicity, that harbors people that uh, are are not fit for managerial roles. He has protected people that have been uh, accused or even demonstrated of gross misconduct. Um, he basically is like the Pope of gaming's Catholic church, where he's just like, yeah, I guess he's doing some good, but he's also doing a lot of bad and just like shuffling these priests around to different areas at the moment they're accused of something. That's basically what he is. So like, I think when I've, I've read some articles on like Bloomberg or um, different financial websites, like you can hear the like more public opinion is like, well, he's a very capable CEO and you see he grew the company to this huge scale. And, you know, he's, he's been very savvy with acquisitions and long-term vision of what they need to acquire and how, and all this and how to monetize things. It's like, okay, okay. But the moment you look underneath the surface level and you see the crap underneath that's crusted underneath the surface, it's pretty horrifying. And uh, this was also, I mean, let's be honest, this was foreseen. They had suggested that Bobby Kotick was going to hang out for a little while. And then shortly after the acquisition closes, he was going to uh, retire and ride off into the sunset. And I have no doubt that as a result of this acquisition, the dude is easily a billionaire now. And if not, he's very close. So I, I think he's just going to go off do whatever he wants, live on his mega yacht. And, you know, he gets to ride off into the sunset. Unfortunately, I mean, that's just how this kind of thing goes. Uh, but at the very least, he will not be at the top of the company. And hopefully this means that we're going to see some foundational changes to Activision, to Blizzard, to King, to all of these developers that they own. And I hope that means better games, first and foremost, less toxic monetization, uh, better treatment of employees, of course, all of these other things um that could potentially come once this domino has fallen so not really that shocking i was thinking he might hang out until next summer but to hear that he's stepping away officially uh like before christmas uh i think makes sense as for when exactly he leaves who knows but uh it seems like probably pretty immediately makes sense right before christmas you drop this letter and you just retire but i mean this is it was the the story that we all kind of were expecting and um unfortunately in big corporate business a lot of the time the bad guys still win unfortunately because once you're at the top of the heap you have the control and the power like and that just is what it is and that's what the the real frustrating thing with bobby Kotick, and i unfortunately i think a lot of his legacy is going to be 
is just that he was heading up Activision Blizzard. The employees hated him, except the board of directors wanted to keep him in control because he had, for 30 years, grown the company a lot. So he was very good for shareholders, very bad for employees. And I think a lot of the customers would also say that they were quite frustrated with how he ran things. So it just is what it is. But at the very least, he won't be at the, the helm of that company anymore. Uh, Hidden Ones, lots of people retiring or quitting this year. It seems like it. Don't you think, Luke? Um, well, Hidden Ones, I, like on the one hand, there's been a lot of layoffs. And a, a lot of people have been baffled by that. They're like, gaming is better than ever. Why is this? Why are there all these layoffs this year? And it's simply a matter of... Uh, a sort of a layover effect from COVID where money was basically free. And this is something that if you're not involved with finance or, or anything, that's totally fine. But I just need you to understand when interest rates are at effectively zero because inflation is higher than the, the actual rate that's being charged by like the Fed, it's basically free money. So you can take out these massive loans and, and do all this crazy stuff and acquire new studios and you can go and hire more people and expand offices and start new projects and all this because the money's free. It's basically like, okay, if, if you've ever run a small business and somebody gives you a check and is like, hey, uh, so you can just like take this money and uh, you don't like, you pay me back exactly what it is. So you, you're the, the range of like profit is, is all of a sudden um, broadened because you aren't going to have to factor in a 10% interest rate on the construction loan or something relatively close, like maybe half an hour from where I live right now, there's a brand new Amazon distribution center being built and it's been being built for like a year and a half. This thing apparently is like a $500 million complex. Okay. $500 million. Guess when they started it? Right at the top of COVID, when everything was at its worst, they started it because that's when the money was free. And so all of a sudden they could afford to take out all these massive loans and begin the production and, and development of the site. And it's not even done yet. Like they've been working on it all these years and it's still in the works. Um, but it was possible because debt was so cheap. And as a result, similar things happened in the gaming space where they brought in all of these extra teams. They acquired new uh, developers and studios entirely. They added new offices. They added new infrastructure. They started new projects. They did all this stuff. And now debt is not free. In fact, we've had the quickest spike in interest rates in quite some time. So all of a sudden debt's very expensive. So if these companies want to continue working on these projects and they need more cash and they aren't just sitting on a, a cash pile, like most of these huge companies with mobile game studios and stuff are, they have to take out loans to pay for that or issue bonds and things like that. And they're kind of screwed. They're kind of screwed. So they're like, uh, well, we can't afford to do this anymore. So then they start laying people off because they overexpanded and now they have to bring it back down to a reasonable size. And it sucks because the employees didn't do anything wrong. They just took a job that presented itself and then they moved there for the job. They worked there for a couple of years and now they're being let go because the corporate managers and, and financiers didn't have the long-term like foresight to see that this might not actually work out. And it's just unfortunate, but it's, it's what happens when you have basically free money. And then just a couple years later, very expensive Radical money Virgil right next donated to it. $5 through super chat. Like, please check out project perceiver. It looks too good to be true. Project Perceiver. I can Google that. Um, so with all this, I mean, you're saying that there's people that are like a lot of people are retiring. A lot of people are stepping away. And I think there's a handful of reasons for that. I don't feel like it's been more than normal. Honestly, maybe there's stats to, to demonstrate I'm wrong, but I feel like it's been pretty in line. But I have heard a lot of developers say, especially after like these insomniac uh, leaks and everything, they're like, hey, if I'm just working in game dev, but I have to worry that all of my personal information is going to be leaked just because I happen to be working on this video game. They're like, I'm honestly not interested. Like, I'm really just, I'll go work in film or television or at a bigger software company not involved with this. I'll just go somewhere else. And I, I don't blame them. I don't blame them at all. It's why I've been trying to really encourage people to be like, to to try and be as, as forgiving and frankly, not toxic as they possibly can manage because these developers don't deserve any of this. 
Like they just don't. And it's so terrible to see these developers who work their asses off for years and years and years, pour their hearts and souls into these projects to see them not just have their work dropped early, but to have their personal information leaked is just horrible. It just sucks. A lot of huge companies seem to be woefully short-sighted in general. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's there's there's an issue for some corporations um, based on like compensation packages. You know what we have to do. You know what we have to do. The whole point of having a CEO compensated with stock, because this is the thing, like uh, people think that like Jeff Bezos is just getting, and I, I, I say people, there are plenty of people who have said that like, oh, well, Jeff Bezos is just, he's sitting on tons of cash, right? So when they hear that he's worth a hundred plus billion dollars, they imagine like a hundred billion dollars in cash sitting in a checking account. That's not how any of this works, okay? Um, he has the overwhelming majority of his wealth tied up in Amazon stock. So it's not actually liquid. Like it's something he owns. He owns those shares, but it's not liquid. Like he can't take those shares and just go out and buy a Ferrari with one of those shares or a few of those shares. It's, they had a stock split, so it's a lot more than one share now. But um, it's not that simple. Anyway, uh, he he doesn't have all that liquid money. But the reason that they pay CEOs and executives with stock options is because they want the CEO to have a long-term horizon. So this is like the timeline. We can just say this is like 2040. Maybe this right here is 2030. This is 2020. Back here is 2010. And maybe back here is 2000. So if we're looking at this and like Jeff is hired right here or, or is being compensated. This is when he's negotiating his package. What would they rather pay him as? If you're the board of directors and you own shares of stock and you want your shares to be worth more in the future, how do you pay the executives? How do you pay the guys running the company to prioritize growing the company and not just making quick cash right now? How do you focus on long-term investments that'll pay off bigger in the long run instead of paying them and benefiting in the short term. Well, the way you do it is by giving them stock options that they redeem in the future. So what they could say is, okay, in 2010, you'll be able to buy, and it's honestly, it's more frequent than this. It's like usually annually or biannually or something, but they'll say in 2010, you can buy X number of shares. Um, let's just say like a million shares and you can buy them at 10 bucks a pop, even though they're actually worth, they, they right now are worth like 11. So you're saving money on them you're effectively being paid that $1 difference per share. So at a million shares, a dollar a piece, you just made a million bucks if you were to buy them for that discount and then immediately sell them on the open market, right? So it's like worth a million dollars, right? But with that understanding, what Jeff is gonna do now is he's gonna look at it and be like, okay, well, I know I'm gonna get this, this money in the future. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna focus on growing the company and building the worth of the company. So when I get that stock option, it's not just worth, you know, the, the um, what I said before, it was like $11 is what it's worth now, but I can buy it for 10. And so I end up profiting $1. It's like, instead, I'm gonna push it so that it's actually worth 20 bucks a share. And when I buy it for 10, I'm gonna make 10 bucks a share and times that $1 million number for the total number of shares, I'm going to pocket 10 million. Instead of just one, if I were to do it today, I'm going to pocket $10 million. So he focuses on building the long-term worth of the company. So when he redeems that stock option, he makes more money. And that's how they do it with all of this is in 2020, they'll set another compensation package, 2030, 2040. And in reality, again, it's like every couple of years, it's not like this. Um, but they prioritize that where they're being compensated by stock price or by stock options, which benefit from higher stock prices. And the way you get higher stock prices is by building value in the company, not just returning short-term revenues. So you end up with somebody who is really, really good. That's able to just build like an exponential growth of stock price. And so they make tons of money. The board of directors makes tons of money and everybody's happy. The problem comes though, when one of those CEOs is not expecting to be around for that period of time. What happens if you have a CEO like a Bobby Kotick, or we saw this actually the perfect example. 
the perfect example of this is what happened with Zenimax. You guys remember like 2017, 2018, something really weird started happening with Zenimax where Zenimax came to all of these presentations and E3 2018 and all these, these things and started showing off a lot of live service games. They started showing off like Fallout 76. They started showing off all of this stuff that didn't seem to be in their wheelhouse. Like, it's like you're having Bethesda Game Studios make an always online Fallout MMO. What? Like, why are you having them do it? How does that make any sense? But they had them do that because they were trying to maximize revenues in the short term. What you'd hope is that long term, the priority would be to have the, the value of the company go up exponentially like that, right? That's what you would hope is that this would be the result for Zenimax and Bethesda Softworks, Bethesda Game Studios, all of their companies. You'd hope that this would be the long-term value. This is what you would typically see in a corporation that's publicly traded, but that's not what we saw. What we saw instead was a strategy that basically seemed to be trying to do this and then plummet <laughs> and kind of wobble off. So they were trying to maximize revenues by doing these live service games and things like Fallout 76 to drive quick revenue. And they were of course hoping that it would continue to grow like that. But let's be honest, it was, it was always going to probably like spike and peak with the release of like the Fallout first thing and all of their microtransactions and their mobile games. And then it was going to probably dip because they had burned through a lot of their customer goodwill because their core gamers didn't really like that stuff. And that's what's happened with Activision, with uh, like Blizzard, for example, where they've burned through a lot of goodwill, where now like Blizzard fans are totally crestfallen. Nobody believes anything that they say anymore because they've done exactly this. But the reason that I think Bobby Kotick was doing this with Activision was because he wanted to boost revenues because he was trying to find his exit and his final exit out of Activision was going to be selling to like a Microsoft or an Apple or something like that. And he was able to do it. And in the case of Zenimax, this is exactly what happened where they boosted revenues, burned a lot of goodwill to get there. And then they were in this range when they were negotiating with Phil and Satya and everybody to be acquired by Xbox. And so they valued it off of this uh, kind of range of of revenues and money that they were making and that priced it at, you know, within this range, they decided it was worth whatever it was like 7 billion. No, it was 12 billion. I don't remember how much it was, however much money it was. So they priced it off that, which is still a lot higher than if they were trying to price how much the company was worth back here. This would have been worth a lot less, right? So they achieved their goal, but it's because they were focused on short term profits and revenues instead of long-term success. And this is why like Amazon has been so successful is because Amazon doesn't ever do this. Like Jeff Bezos is not interested in selling Amazon to anybody, not that anybody could afford to buy them, but he's always had the approach of long-term investments for massive upside in the long term, even if that means extreme expense in the short term. Amazon wasn't profitable for like the first 15, 20 years of its creation. Like Amazon hemorrhaged money, but it's because they were pouring all this money into expansion to be able to do stuff long term. So with all this, it's just a matter of motivations within the executives and the board of directors. Within Zenimax, now it makes a lot of sense why they were doing this, why for so long they were pushing to, well, do exactly this, to, to boost revenues in the short term, to get a benefit of selling off the company for a higher price, even if that left the company weaker as a result. And with Activision Blizzard, I think it's been a similar thing where in the last five, six, seven years, Bobby Kotick has been trying to figure out what's my final exit? What's my last chapter of my story? And he's like, I'm going to sell Activision Blizzard. I've built it into this huge company worth $70 billion. I'm going to sell it to like Microsoft. And then I'm going to exit and I'll be like one of the greatest CEOs that the gaming industry has ever seen, which I'm sure his friends are telling him, like, let's be honest, his, his friends are probably hyping him up like that. So that's exactly what he did is that he just pushed the, the crazy monetization of Blizzard stuff, of all these mobile games of Call of Duty and everything. And it worked, but it burned a lot of goodwill along the way. And uh, it's really hard to undo that, which is the struggle that I think Phil Spencer is going to be dealing with in the, the near term is just trying to undo a lot of that crap 
that happened. Trying to win back gamers and fans so that they don't associate what Bobby Kotick did with what he wants to do, so. But with all this, I don't think that this year has been like rife with people retiring or or uh, executives stepping out. I think that we're starting to reach a point where a lot of the guys that started in the industry back in like the early 2000s or late 90s, they are reaching that age. So you're probably gonna see a handful of them start to retire and step away um, or try to figure out something else to do, but that's not really that surprising what's what's scary to me and should be scary for everybody is the consolidation of publishers and developers that is not good for the broader public you know we can all say like well but it's good that sony's finally getting competition that's true but i just don't think that it's good to have so many developers and so many publishers all under one roof within Xbox or PlayStation or Embracer Group or Tencent or any of these other companies. I think when there's broader competition, that's better than when it's all underneath a couple of overarching companies. Because here's the thing. You might like Phil Spencer. I like Phil Spencer personally. He's an actual gamer. You can run into him while playing online games. And he's he seems to be a, a very truly nice guy. And I think he is looking out for the, the gamers um, while he's making these decisions because he is a gamer himself. He gets it. That being said, Phil Spencer will not always be running Xbox. Okay. It's very likely that Phil Spencer actually leaves his post at the end of this generation. It's very, very possible. A lot of these uh, big companies have a history of basically cycling out the leadership of their console teams every generation. They got rid of Sean Layden. They bring in Jim Ryan as the, the new kind of head honcho of the team. And then he's leaving. They're bringing in somebody else. We don't know who yet. Um, they have an interim guy working it right now, but they're bringing in somebody else eventually. And so just because you like Phil Spencer does not mean that the next guy is going to do very well. Just think back to like 2013 Xbox, 2012 Xbox. Like it was pretty horrifying <laughs> with some of the stuff that they were saying to do. So um, it only takes one guy to come in and head up that team to basically undo everything Phil Spencer did. But this time he will own and be in charge of like a third of all the developers in the industry. So I don't like the consolidation of developers. I don't, I don't like it. I'd prefer that it didn't happen, but what are you going to do? He took my thing.